This is Paul Schneiderman on the seventh edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. And today we have a terrific guest on the seventh edition. We have Trish Bostrom. Trish is a distinguished Seattle area resident, a former star tennis player. Trish played at the University of Washington. She was inducted to the University of Washington Athletic Hall of Fame in 1987. We're going to learn more from Trish today about her career and some of her thoughts on some other sports and tennis issues. Trish had tremendous courage in 1972 when she pursued a legal case based on equality and civil rights principles, seeking an improved tennis program at the University of Washington. Trish is a pioneer in the fight for Title IX issues. Trish um, will comment today on the new movie that's out, The Battle of the Sexes, about Billie Jean King's famous 1973 tennis match at the Astrodome with Bobby Riggs. And today, Trish has her own Battle of the Sexes tennis story that took place right here in Seattle, the University of Washington. Trish uh, played tennis professionally, internationally. She once ranked fifth in the world in doubles, 35th in singles. Trish uh, has competed in the four major tournaments, Wimbledon, the French Open, the Australian Open, and the U.S. Open. Trish, after concluding her pro tennis career, went to law school and has been a practicing attorney now for many years. Trish, thank you for coming on Sports and Stuff. Paul, so it's so great to be here. Thank you very much. Trish, we have a lot of subjects to talk about today. I want to start with this movie, The Battle of the Sexes, and some of the movie reviewers are of the opinion it may be the best tennis movie ever with Emma Stone as Billie Jean King, Steve Carroll as the late Bobby Riggs. Trish, you have a very neat perspective. You were actually at that match in 1973. What do you think of the movie? That's right, Paul. Actually, the movie is excellent. I really enjoyed the movie. It really shows the determination Billie Jean had and how she prepared for the match and the psychological problems of the match. And also it shows what Bobby Riggs was doing at the same time. But I was there and I remember all of us were playing a Virginia Slims tournament and we all made these shirts that said love Billy and a big picture of Billy on the shirt hate Bobby and so we were not sure how she was going to come out uh, in, in the Astrodome so they got a bus for us and we all went in the bus and this is everybody Chris Everett Gula Gong all the players went wearing these shirts and we formed two lines um, thinking Billy Jean would come and run through our lines with our special shirts on and all of a sudden Billy Jean came out and they put her on this platform with four muscle men carrying the platform and she was sitting on a Cleopatra chair and the press was at the end of the line and they just squished us in order to get to Billy Jean so it was very exciting then we all went Went into the stands and watched uh, the match, and it, it was tremendous that she won. It sure helped the women's professional circuit because we needed that victory. Paul Schneiderman of Rainier Avenue Radio with Trish Bostrom. Did, did you think that film was a realistic portrayal of the actual match? Yes, I did. I did. I thought it was very, definitely very much uh, what occurred. The The atmosphere that evening was electric. Uh, everybody had different signs with, you know, male chauvinist or, you know, go Billy and go Bobby. And he came out in that Sugar Daddy um, outfit warm-up because he had a contract with Sugar Daddy to come out with that. But it was very similar to actually being there the uh being right there at, at that evening well i saw the movie earlier this week and i really enjoyed the movie as well trish you grew up in seattle um tennis has certainly become a very significant part of your life how did you become enamored with the game of tennis as a young person you know i was very lucky the west seattle junior chamber of commerce had a, a free tennis clinic for kids at hiawatha west seattle park hiawatha park and i grew up in fauntleroy and uh, all of us from the neighborhood went to this tennis clinic, and there I fell in love with the sport. I had been swimming and diving before, but suddenly at tennis, I just loved tennis. And then my father, Al Bostrom, was the head of the downtown YMCA, and there were no indoor courts here in Seattle, so we would go every Sunday night downtown to the Y, and there we would hit in a handball court. He was an excellent handball player. and. When you start in tennis, if you just hit against a backboard, that is a great way to improve your game. So that's how I started. And finally, the tennis club built indoor courts, and then I could play tennis all year round. But it seems like you learn tennis in a pretty humble environments. Yes, definitely. Uh, definitely from from the parks. And because they had that program for neighborhood kids, that really started my great interest in tennis. Great. Trish, you became an accomplished tennis player in high school, and I know you played tennis in University of Washington 
women's team. In about 1972, I mentioned this in the introduction, you pursued a very famous legal case against the University of Washington demanding two things. One, a women's program equal to the men's tennis program. You also demanded the right to try out for the men's team until such changes were implemented. Can you share with us a little bit more about the case? For example, is there a lawsuit? Can you share with us a little more about it? Yes. Uh, actually, my, my quest for equality for women athletes really began in high school. In high school, I worked out with the team. I did all the calisthenics. I did all the uh, uh, drills and everything, and I could beat many of the, the boys because I spent so much time at tennis. I had spent so much time practicing. And I can remember when I was a junior at Chief South High School, I wrote a letter to Frank Ensley, that's Jay Ensley's father, right. uh, who was the head of the athletic department for Seattle Public Schools. And in that letter I said, oh, Frank, I work out, I do everything with the guys. I, I want to play on the Chief South tennis team. It doesn't say Chief South boys tennis team, but it's says Chief South Tennis Team. I received a nice little letter back saying, sorry Trish, the team is only for boys. When I got to college, there was a women's tennis team and a men's tennis team. The women's tennis team, however, was not funded, was underfunded substantially. For instance, the men flew to their matches, we drove to ours, the men had all the equipment provided, we had to provide our own equipment. The men had a wow. great, great coach, Bill Quillian, who had played on the international circuit. No, the family will. And he was working with me late at night at the tennis club. He was a very nice man. We had a graduate assistant that knew very little about tennis. So there were great inequities between the two programs. And so when this this injustice continued to gnaw at in me, within me. And then my father was talking to a, a squash player down at the downtown Y, who was an attorney, Don Cohen, and mentioned my the inequities. And the uh, person, Don Cohen, said, oh, have Trish come up and see me. So the next day I went up to see Don. I explained the whole situation. And I'll never forget it. He leaned across his desk and said, Trish, I'll take your case for free. And so that's when we began bringing to the university the inequity between the two programs, and we were asking for the equality between the women's athletic programs and the men's, and during the interim, I asked for the opportunity to try out for the men's team. Bill Quilliam was the coach of the men's team, and I really wanted to get receive the coaching from Bill in order to take that next step of going on the international circuit. What was the outcome? Was there an actual lawsuit filed? Actually, the, we did not. We did not have to file a lawsuit because what we did is usually before you f sue somebody, you try and have a pretrial hearing. Correct. And so my my attorney Don Cohen and then Gary Gayton, they know them both. They asked for a pretrial hearing. The university took many months. Finally agreed. Uh, to have a pretrial hearing, and I'll never forget that hearing. I walk in, and there's a long table with all, must have been 10 men, uh, assistant um, vice president of the university, the athletic directors, all in suits and narrow ties, and myself and the two lawyers. And we presented our case, we presented the inequities be between the programs, and I have to hand it to the university, because the university, after a week of, of our pretrial hearing, they said, you know, Trish, you're right. You're right, the programs are inequitable, so yes, we will work to, to equitable, to e make those programs more equitable, and you'll have the right to try out. This was pre-Title IX, right before Title IX passed. Paul Schneiderman of Rainier Avenue Radio with Trish Bostrom. Okay, Trish, so I'm going to ask you about your famous tryout, um, but what was the reaction to, to your claim? Did, did, did you get support, from, for example, from the male tennis players and the, the coach at that time, Bill Quillian? What was the general reaction to your to your uh, grievance? It was, um, I can remember my parents uh, shield, shielded me from negative calls that were coming into the house. Um, and so they took those calls and later told me, six years later, it was, there were many negative calls regarding that. So it, no, there was not a lot of support from either side. Um, I was brought in by Kit Green, who was the uh, women's in charge of the women's programs at the University of Washington and I was brought in and said Trish do not do what you're doing stop what you're doing do not rock the boat and so I didn't receive um, a support from the women either but I kept saying it's wrong I have to, somebody has to step up because I didn't know something. that I didn't know that you didn't receive universal support from the women either. yes but I think that's also because the women that were in power that could have done something they were relying on their jobs 
their jobs, if Kit Green had spoken out, she might have lost her job. Interesting. So when looking back on it, I now see that maybe that was the reason they could not speak out. But the athletes, we as athletes, I could speak out because I wasn't tied to a job at the University of Washington. And there were other players, another friend of mine, Linda Tawero from, she was playing in New Orleans um, and at Tulane University, and she was pressing the envelope, doing the same thing at that university too. So it was really the athletes, I believe, at that time who were pressing the envelope and saying this inequity is not right. There needs to be a change. Well, you had a lot of courage what you did as a young woman athlete in that era. Trish, there was a famous true story where you had a match to try to get on the men's tennis team. And I referred to this earlier as your own battle of the sexes story that took place in University of Washington. You played a male player for the final spot, I believe by the name of William Carleon? Yes, that was Bill Carline. And... Um, I didn't realize till many years later that he wasn't the final spot. He was number five, and there was one more person below him that I could have I played. I didn't know that. I didn't either until years when I was on the circuit. I read an article, and uh, the article said, oh, there was one other player below that. So nobody told me um, at that time. But the uh, match was... Um, uh, it was... Historic very, match. Historic match. Um it's difficult. You have di you have different uh, pressures when you play a match such as that. Different pressures on you uh, trying to make change. So I can really relate to Billie Jean. She's playing Bobby Riggs in a much more a larger venue, a larger match, with tremendous pressure. Tremendous pressure was on her in order to win that match. You know, Trish, I think on some levels, your match with Bill may have been almost more consequential because that determined whether you're going to be on the team or not. Yes, that's 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 very true. That's very true. And I can rem remember, I, unfortunately, I lost that match, and I can remember walking back alone to the IMA building uh, sitting in the locker room alone and just thinking to myself, don't worry, you're going to graduate early and go on the international circuit. So my whole focus then was to graduate early, to go play internationally, which was my dream, to play Wimbledon, the Australian Open, the French Open, and play on the international circuit. Well, you may have just read my next question. I was going to ask you about your international tennis career on the pro circuit, and I know that you played doubles with Billie Jean King. What was it like playing with Billie Jean King? Um, I played against Billie Jean. I, unfortunately, I did not have the chance to play with her, but I played against her at Wimbledon, and we had a great win. I was playing with Mary Carrillo, who's doing tennis commentating now uh, at all the major events. And we were at Wimbledon. It was center court at Wimbledon. Billie Jean and Karen Sussman were seated, and we beat them in three sets, um, and it was a very exciting match. My parents were in the stand, and great friends from Australia were in the stand, so it was for Mary, uh, Carillo and I, it was just a tremendous, tremendous match. Billie Jean was a a fantastic volleyer. You you served and volleyed, and that's what all of us did then. We we served and volleyed, whereas Chris Everett was a baseline player. So Billie Jean was an excellent doubles player with very quick hands and great volleys. You like her a lot? Billie Jean has tremendous, yes, tremendous courage, a great idea person. Uh, she and Larry King started many of the, the first tennis camp. Uh, they started the Women's Tennis Association. They really started the Virginia Slim Circuit. Uh, they were great idea people. They started World Team Tennis, uh, which, and all of those things that they started, the other players of us who were younger, we all benefited from what they started. Well, people benefited from your work as well, Trish. <laughs> Trish, so what was the prize money like for women tennis players when you played international tennis in the 1970s? Oh, now that is another another great story. Um, when I played Wimbledon, you could not you could not, um, you had to do well in singles, doubles, or mixed doubles because Wimbledon first round loser was $300 and my air ticket was $800. Uh, the wow. first round men's, uh, first round men loser, ma male loser at Wimbledon was $800. So they were able to cover their airfare at least. So you had to do well at Wimbledon, either in singles, doubles, or mixed doubles. And all, most all of the players played all three events because the money was, was so low. Now the, 
first round loser at at Wimbledon is, is I think eight thousand, maybe ten thousand dollars. So there's a big difference in the amount of funds that are available for players. Um, in the world today. Trish, you played in a now defunct interna- uh, professional tennis league, the World Tennis Pro League. What were those days like? Yes, World Team Tennis. This was a great, uh, great fun time. It was from 1974 to 1979. And you played, you were drafted like a football player or a basketball player. They had a draft. You were drafted. You signed a contract for to play four months for City. I played for the Boston Lobsters. And then I played two years for the Indiana, Indiana Loves. Great names, by the way. Great names. And then Seattle started a team. So Tom Gorman and myself came to Seattle. We were signed contracts with the Seaport Cascade. Then the last team I played for was the New Orleans Nets. World Team Tennis uh, was a tremendous uh, way to for players to earn enough money to pay for the rest of their uh, year on the circuit. It's still going today in minor markets, though. It's not as large of a... Uh, a team organization that it was when I played. Interesting. I didn't know much about that league in, until yes. we, we talked about today. Trish, um, you went to law school, and I know you've had a successful career in mostly the estate planning area. Um, just out of curiosity, you have experience, you had a major experience in a civil rights issue. Have you ever had any interest in practicing in civil rights law? Oh, I think civil rights would be uh, a fascinating area to um, to to work in. Um, I do give speeches on Title IX, and I think Title IX is so important, not just for athletics for women, but all areas. Title IX first opened the doors for women to the law schools, the med schools, the chemistry labs, the computer science courses, the physics labs. So all of those were opened up to women, um, and Title IX is so important, and uh, there, there have been recent attacks on Title IX in an effort to take away to eviscerate Title IX, and and I think we all have to be vigilant to keep it keep it strong. Good points, Paul Schneiderman, Rainier Avenue Radio with Trish Bostrom. Trish, um, I did some reading about you before the show today, and I read that in 1987, when you were inducted in the University of Washington Athletic Hall of Fame, you received an apology from the now late former University of Washington President William Gerberding. What was yeah. your reaction to that apology? It was. Um, amazingly amazing reaction um what happened was here we were at the hall of fame dinner i'm being inducted into the hall of fame and bill gerbening says oh trish we're very sorry for what you had to do endure at the university of washington and it was just as if uh, all of the uh, anger just washed off my back and and all of the negative um residue from those experiences just washed off my back. It was cleansing then. It was cleansing. And then what happened to me is then uh, then Mike Lude called me up and said, Trish, would you be on the Big W board for the University of Washington? I said yes and became president of the Big W. And then I joined the alumni board and became president of of the uh, University of Washington Alumni Association. Great. And so... it, it, I, I've had a, an opportunity to give back to the University of Washington. That's great. Trish, there are some very well-known tennis players of color, such as the late Arthur Ashe, currently Venus and Serena Williams, but tennis is still frequently stereotyped as a predominantly white, upper-middle-class sport. What do you think tennis associations and others involved in tennis could do to get more minorities and lower-income people involved in the game of tennis? You know, I, I knew Arthur Ashe. He was a tremendous man, tremendous man, a very, very strong, peaceful man, um, and he made great changes in tennis. I'll tell you a quick story. We both went to South Africa to play the South African circuit, and I was on the same plane as Arthur was. Arthur had just won Wimbledon, and they wanted him there because he was a Wimbledon winner. And But Arthur said, I will only come if you allow integrated spectator seating. In South Africa, they used to have black-only sections. Right, apartheid. uh, Apartheid seating all throughout the stadium. And he wanted black uh, ball boys and ball girls on the circuit. He also wanted the black athletes to be able to compete on the tennis sugar circuit. And not many people don't know this, but he made these demands. And because he did, South Africa Tennis Association said, yes, we agree to your, your what you're asking. And they made all those changes, which were huge changes at the time for it's South quite a story. Africa. Huge changes. And so I think that, I also think Serena and Venus Williams have been excellent examples of, of excellent 
tennis players and excellent leaders for the Women's Tennis Association and for tennis to show that that all athletes can excel in this sport. So, uh, Sloane Stevens, who is a black athlete, won the women's at the U.S. Open. Right. What the USTA needs to do, that's the United States Lawn Tennis Association and other associations throughout the world, is they need to continue to offer free very low cost, free clinics in underrepresented areas, in low income areas, to give access to players. Our problem here in the Northwest is that it rains too much. And so we only have a few facilities. Most of the indoor courts are private clubs. True. We do have Amy Yee Tennis Center, which is tremendous, which is they have 12 indoor courts. But originally with Forward Thrust, we were supposed to have a public indoor tennis center in the south, in the central district, and also in the north. Only Amy Yee was built. So more indoor tennis centers need to be built, which are for public use. Well, I think it's such a great game, and you just see so many tennis courts in rural, urban, and suburban communities in America, but not always a lot of players. So uh, it'd be great to see the game introduced to more people, and I yes. think we're on the same page. Trish, um, I hear this a lot from people who are former athletes. I know some former NBA, MLB, and... and uh, NFL players, I frequently hear from some players, former players, some of them are of your era, that a lot of the younger athletes do not really appreciate or recognize some of the struggles that some of these former professional players went through and improving players' rights and so forth. Do you, do you feel, Trish, that, that young women tennis players are good at recognizing the history of what some pioneers like Trish Bostrom have done to improve the game of women's tennis? That's a very good question. And in that question, um, you know, maybe it's our fault for not talking enough to them, the younger players, on what it was like before. Just like now in my speeches to, on Title IX, I tell younger people, I tell people that your right to Title IX may be taken away, may be taken away. You must speak out. You must be a you have not lived through what it's like when you don't have those rights. And that's, that's crucial. That's very, very, very important. Um, the the um, aspect, let me tell you a little story. Chris Goldberg was, Goldberg was the uh, basketball coach for the University sure. of Washington. She said, came up to me and said, Trish, my players, everything's handed to them. They have scholarships. They have great coaches. They, they don't understand. And I said, Chris, just let me come and speak to them. Speak to them about what it was like when we didn't before Title IX. And that's what I think we need to make sure and, and tell the young players that it, their scholarships are just not given for granted. They can't take them just for granted. All of the opportunities they have, somebody before them had to do something to make it. No question. Make it happen. No question. And that's all not in athletics. That's also in politics. In every area, there were leaders before that stepped up to make it better for the future generation. Well, I really appreciate your perspective. I wanted to learn a little bit more from your perspective as a uh, successful women's tennis player, how the younger generation uh, reacts to some of the issues that you went through. Trish, today there's a lot of household tennis names, uh, Roger Federer, the Williams sisters, the list goes on. And one thing that, tell me if I'm off base here, it seems in the 70s and 80s that more non-tennis fans and very, very casual tennis fans were plugged the TV watching the likes of John McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, Chris Everett, and others. Has tennis lost its edge a little bit as a TV sport? What what has happened, I think, is that uh, tennis had a great boom in the 70s. And all those people became uh, household names. For sure. However, in that era, we only had four TV programs, four TV main networks. So when Wimbledon came around, you could see it on NBC or you could see it without getting a cable. And now what, what has happened is you have like the tennis channel. So if you want to pay for the channel, tennis channel, then you'll get the tennis channel. But they probably won't show the U.S. Open or Wimbledon on the NBC 
CBS programs. So I think what's happened is that it's taken away the ability to reach all of the non-tennis players, uh, the ability because they might not buy the tennis channel, and so you've narrowed your tennis channel down to elite tennis players. People that know the game know the game, uh, but it is it's still a tremendous game, and I think it will st- still grow as more people look at the injuries in football due to concussions and parents thinking, "Ooh, do I really want my child uh, being in a sport where you have a chance for a concussion?" Um, whereas tennis is is a sport where you you don't have those uh, problems um, of, of major injuries. There's some great tennis going on. It just seems that on many levels that it's more of a niche tennis crowd watching some of the more well-known matches these days. Is that an unfair no, perception? I, or? I, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think that the they need to broaden the broaden the um, the TV coverage of tennis. Uh, they used to cover doubles also, and now you rarely see doubles on on the international it's true. Net- networks. And doubles is a fantastic. Even I think it's more fun to watch because you have four people at court. On the court, you have four people usually at net volleying. The the ball goes very fast because people are volleying at the net, which is a close proximity. So taking out, I think they need to bring doubles back and more coverage of tennis. Those are really good points, Trish. Trish, we don't have a lot of time left. We have less than a minute. Who are some of your favorite tennis players? Oh, I love uh, Federer. Federer is unbelievable. I love Serena Williams. I mean, incredible, uh, incredible uh, muscles and incredible fitness. I love Venus Williams. She's an extraordinary player. Great athlete. Uh, Nadal. Rafa Nadal is a great, great person, great player. Um, there are many good players coming up. So and Stevens played very well at the at um, the U.S. Open. So there are many players. Fortunately for America, there are many players coming up uh, in American tennis, which will be really very good. What does the future hold for Trish, Trish Bostrom? This will probably be my last question today. What do you? What oh, are your cards I'd, in the I'd love to give more speeches on Title IX. I'd love to encourage people to support Title IX, uh, to work for for justice, to help uh, young athletes, to Great. mentor young women, um, and and young young boys in 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 their careers. Trish, it's just been just been great to have you on my show. I hope to have you come back one day. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been tremendous.